Hi, this is John Reed. I am joined by Dick Hirsch. We are outside at Sapphire now on the very last day. Dick's about to yes. hop on a plane. Sweating outside. Dude, this is a year since our last reunion because we missed the yes. SAP Tech Ed season entirely. You and I were at different shows. Yep. So for SAP folks out there, this is our annual review of what happened uh, day three. Now, yep. um, what I did want to say is that things are shifting a lot. I mean, for you, you're not doing as much with SAP as you once did. But, right. But then your cloud sensibility has been heightened. So yes. maybe just tell the listeners what you've been up to. Yeah, so what I do at Atos is I'm involved in our ServiceNow practice. And so I deal with um, various ServiceNow instances that we have that um, are, most of them are multi-tenant, hugely multi-tenant. And um, I'm in the domain lead for integration, which means I need to do things like um, single sign-on, and then I do the ITSM integrations, and I have a team of developers, architects, and so I'm very aware of sort of um, what it is to do to live um, cloud on a daily basis. And so it's interesting coming back now to the SAP world and look at how they're looking at cloud based on my experience with ServiceNow. It's inter interesting. Right, because you would argue that ServiceNow is, quote, unquote, true cloud. Uh, I mean, you know. it's... It's 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 a platform yeah. similar to um, what the cloud platform is from SAP, yeah. and so it's interesting to compare the two the two offerings. Um, right. Of course, they're in different areas, at least largely in different areas, but to sort of see how each one evolves or has evolved is right. I think an interesting story. So SAP calls itself a cloud company, so you're the perfect person to scrutinize that assertion and I hope so. see what's what. I hope so, yeah. So so what did you make of, of, of this? We had two very radically different keynotes. Yes. Uh, what, what did you make of it? I mean, for me, I mean, I've been, I mean, everything is about experience um, and getting the customer experience. For me, I like to call this SAP post snap, okay? And I'm talking about the Thanos snap um, in the Avenger movies. Um, and something has changed. I can't quite put my finger on it, but there's been some fundamental change. I'm not talking about the one restructuring effort which went on, but something is different. And I don't quite know what it is. Uh, the, I sort of got a feeling of it when I was watching the board members in the Q&A, and I started realizing they're really young. I mean, right. it's, it's a whole sort of different feeling, and when you hear that board members use Slack, like on a, on a daily basis, that's something fundamentally different. Mm. Um, and so for me, I think I'm trying to figure out whether it's an age thing, whether I'm just getting old, but I think how SAP is sort of looking at cloud is now, they've always looked at it sort of um, in a SAP specific fashion. Now they're becoming much more aware in terms of what the market is, in terms of like the hyperscalers. Um, they're very aware that customers want to go to the hyperscalers. And they how, how do you deal with that? Not only in terms of the cloud platform, but also in terms of S4. Right. And for listeners who aren't clued into the hyperscaler lingo, of course, you're from uh, AWS. Is AWS. Google, and um, Microsoft is yours right, in the world. Right. Yeah. And the, the new um, Google Cloud Platform, which was, I think, today, not they didn't really announce it, but now the um, HANA Enterprise Cloud is also being offered by SAP on GCP. Yeah, I think one very interesting thing about this show is that there wasn't like any like huge news headlines, and yet there right. is. There's so much to digest. Like there's so many important dramas that are taking yes. place underneath that, and like, and and obviously from a customer perspective, like this sort of dizzying array of various themes that SAP has rolled out the last few years. There was digital transformation themes, and of course before that the Hana speed enterprise right. themes and then we moved into the Leonardo themes of next gen technology and then and then into the intelligent enterprise. I may have gotten a couple of those out of order. <laughs> and then right. and then and then this year Qualtrics and wrapping your head around what the impact of Qualtrics on everything. And so I think that's plenty for the average attendee to try to right. grapple with. Right. And know. all the new faces. I mean you see all these new people on stage that you might not have seen in the past. Right. So these are all these sort of um, not only organizational changes, but all these sort of offer changes, offer changes as well. And I think that's 
sort of um, interesting because you always, I mean, I, I look today and I've been at the Sapphire almost 10 years, every year. And it's interesting seeing how sort of things repeat. I mean, processes are always sort of in the background. you got to do something to complement them. Um, so these are sort of the patterns which emerge. But this time, I think they're a little bit more serious. I mean, when you talk to people sort of in the background, I think they're much more focused on getting things done. And that's, maybe that's one reason why we didn't have that many new announcements on, during the Sapphire. Yeah. Yeah, and, and McDermott himself has said that that they're putting the brakes on big mergers and acquisitions, which obviously makes sense because they, right. have, they have so much work to do. I mean, I think the, you know, SAP has been, like, I think for a long time, pretty good on vision and strategy as far as, obviously it can be hard if you're a customer to keep up with it, but I think... Right. I think I think SAP's fundamental sort of argument that transformation is upon us and that you need to put the customer in the center of things. Right. And you need to harness things like AI and machine learning. You need to, uh, and, you, and, you, and the so-called experience thing does matter. That if you can right. get the, th- those things all make sense, right? But but the really hard part for SAP then, okay, you put together that vision. So how do I get started with that? Right. Like how do I Right. You know, because the one real thing is that no one has time for three-year uh, right. elaborate implementations with uncertain future payoffs. Right. But, I mean, I think that's one of the things which is interesting is now the focus on the hyperscalers as sort of as a way for our customers to move forward. Right. In terms of the S4. Yeah. Because, I mean, everything in the end revolves around S4 and right. getting, getting people to move to the new platform. And I think with the focus now, with the agreement that came out today, with all three major hyperscalers trying to bring yeah. people to those, bring people to S4 HANA in a more rapid fashion. Right. That's, I mean, definitely what they have to push. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it can be interesting because what I've talked with SAP about is how so many of the successful SaaS companies have this great, what I, what everyone calls land and expand, right, where... You can start small and then gradually sort of creep your way further right. into more and more stuff because it's like, hey, I really like this company. What else can they do kind of thing? Right. And that's where I think SAP has struggled to to take its vision into that type of mentality. Um, but but to your point, like at least S4 is at the core of things, and and there's a lot of customers that haven't moved yet despite, right. I mean, that's despite the, the big numbers that SAP puts out there. There's right. a lot of customers that haven't moved. DSAG, uh, who I met with, uh, the German user group, German speaking user yeah. group, they have some very interesting stats around that because there's a lot of right, I've seen those. there's a lot of folks who who have kind of slowed slowed on that journey who haven't finished, and so the question becomes, basic what DSAG saying is they need help, <laughs> right. and that help can come in many forms. Right. Um, for some it's business case, for some it's more qualified skills, for others it's more right. automated tools. Right. Um, of course. But there's there's a lot of a lot of that kind of conversation going on. So, uh, but I, I give Hasso a little bit of credit because in the second keynote on that, he was he was saying the same thing. He was like, "We've been bad with the details. We've been good on the vision and bad with the details." Right. Yeah. But so, he also emphasized the um, the the importance of the of the public cloud. Yep. And I mean, which was what, a big change, right? Because right. we can all remember when he was uh, not as thrilled, shall right. we say, with the cloud providers and what they had to offer. Right, but that's, so, I mean, that's clearly a different tone. Now. Right, so that's def- definitely a big change for him. And I mean, as well, you got to make a distinction between things such as S4 HANA running on a, a hyperscaler and like a SaaS application. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're they're not not equivalent. I mean, because yep. SaaS application usually multi-tenant. Right. And S4 how they're setting it up, that's not S4 HANA on the cloud. This is yes. basically a customer, usually a customer specific instance. Which is running on a hyperscaler. Yeah, it's what we talk about as a classic lift and shift, where you're yes. moving you're moving workloads off your on-premise systems, but you're not right. necessarily reaping the so-called true benefits of, of going right. full full cloud. And you know, I've talked with some of the S4 HANA people about this this week, and what we talked about was how it's so important that the partner community and uh, within SAP that are helping these customers with these moves have the expertise to help customers think about that because you can move to the private cloud, but you can still be cognizant of a multi-year journey to be ready right. eventually. And that means gradually becoming more standard, essentially getting right. rid of uh, 
over cumbersome customizations you don't need anymore. But that is a sea change for partners because they right. were used to making money on that type of activity, and and right. that's a big work in progress there because you don't have to just move to the private cloud and a lift and shift mentality. You can do it in, with a model where eventually yes. you might be able to do more with it. It can be an intermediate step, but only if yes. you have the proper mentality and guidance around it. So that's a very yeah, interesting. But that's I mean there. for me because I mean the end goal really is moving people to the S4 HANA cloud. Yep. Because I mean that's where they really have because I mean he talks about when Haas was talking about in the second keynote the speed of, of, of upgrades. Can you really get that only when you are using a SaaS application? Right. Because that's when the provider is doing all the upgrades in the background. Um, and that I think is really the speed of innovation that they want to achieve. If you have a S4 if you have a S4 HANA on a hyperscaler and you still use it in a, to have lots of customizations, then the question is, is of course, um, are you going to be able to move to the to the cloud version of S4 yeah. at some point? Yeah. And I mean, I think that's the that that would be the real goal, because I right. mean, once you move people to the to the S4 HANA cloud version, then I think you have to do the speed. And I mean, I think what's interesting as well is when you take a look at at that sort of the evolution, what is, for example, for a developer, what, how do you, re how do you respond to that? What would be if my company was in the S4 HANA cloud? Right. Um, what is my role? What, what tools do I need? Do I need ABAP? Do I need something else? Yeah. Um, and I think that's also even if you're looking at it from a developer's perspective, is an interesting um, sort of thing that you have to look at in terms of perspective. Future is it? How do I want to position myself? For that journey, yeah, and and I think that that's something that sets SAP up for the tech ed season in the fall, yes. and and we talk with them about that some around how you're going to need to translate this into into options that developers can more easily use, yes. um, including things like making the cloud platform more accessible for trials than it is right yes. now and stuff like that. Um, but one of the things that we talked about was how the uh, the the plan around industry solutions is so important. Yes, um, and we talked with Peter Meyer about that because this is one example where I've had a little trouble getting from SAP roadmaps around what their industry plan is for the for the cloud. And to, in their defense, they have done more work on that. They just haven't gotten it to me <laughs> personally. Right. But but basically, it's interesting there because what Peter said was important. He said we don't want to build a monstrous. Yes. S4 HANA cloud. We don't want to reduplicate SAP right. ERP in the cloud. We want to do this differently. Um, so, in other words, they're going to have some of their industry specific, but then they're going to have partners come in and build add-ons and extensions via the cloud platform, as yes. opposed to these heavyweight monolithic industry solutions of the past, yeah. which is fine. But customers need to really understand those roadmaps, and I think that if I were to give one takeaway from Sapphire, it's that, that those concrete roadmaps are so important. Right. Um, what's SAP doing with the industry in the cloud? Um, how will developers get access to that? The same thing with Qualtrics, right? Like, right. Um, and, and SAP has specified some of the things they're doing with Qualtrics, we, which we could detail a little bit if we have time in this podcast. But, but basically, what are the next steps in terms of embedding this inside of SAP? How right. do developers get access to these tools? Um, right. Because a lot of Qualtrics isn't out of the box solutions; it's using tools for right. for customized projects, right? So, um, so that's a big project for SAP heading into the fall, right. I would say. I mean, I had an interesting conversation with um, individuals from the uh, digital team about having the ability to have, like, the in the in the app store, having and the idea would be, for example, if you are a partner, you would develop an industry solution, not a huge one, but a small add-on. That would be able to be bought in context via um, the commercial process, which is done by the um, supported by the digital team. I mean, I think that's yeah. because just the fact that you have an add-on. The question is, how accessible is it? How easily is it that a customer will find it? Right. Um, and I think what they're doing there is important because it's not only the store itself, but it's contextual within an application. So right. you could be doing some analytics app, and then it comes up, you need more data. We recommend this data. And the same thing with um, um, like um, S4 HANA Cloud add-in. You would say, do you want this data, then you, or do you want this um, extension? Then it would be bought in that fashion. Yeah. And 
uh, I was actually encouraged during the App Center meeting that I attended with three partners because I heard from them much better stories than right. I was expecting as far as um, SAP's gotten a lot better with sales incentives for their right. for their sales force around this. That's now that doesn't well. mean that that doesn't mean that every salesperson gets this yet, but they're starting to figure out that a lot of times selling packaging these apps as part of their deals increases right. the deal size and more likely to close. Um, so it's exciting to see that that's starting to happen because that right. never happened in the past. Right. Or or I would hear these horrible anecdotes on the back channel of like none of these account execs care about what we're doing. Right. Um, so they have incentivized that and started to make that happen. But yeah. it's a long journey. It's not something where they have figured it all out. But it was cool to see the progress. Yeah, but I mean, I think that's, that evolution is critical. Because if you talk about a cloud solution, especially in SaaS, it, it has to be standardized. Yeah. And the, the add-ins and extensions that Partner provides are critical in support of those applications because customer, on occasion, wants something beyond the standard. And the add-ins provide that in a fashion which allows these companies to update on a regular basis. And that's the whole yeah. idea where SAP has learned from the business suite days. That was preventing people from upgrading. All right. Let's put a quick rack on what we have, and then we'll okay. maybe continue a little further on. Um, the, the final things I'll point out are that there was some important news on day one. ASUG, uh, North America User Group, broke the news that they had uh, uh, announced, SAP's announced a new digital access uh, right. platform for documents. It's called DAAP, but it's basically the next step in, in indirect access clarification. Right. Um, it's be being hailed by some user groups as something of a victory. DSAG was heavily involved as well. What I liked is that it's a dialogue that shows improvement from last year. I'm not ready to call it a victory, but right. but 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 what it does is it provides more more of a realistic understanding of what SAP's new pricing model is could potentially cost, um, right. and it clarifies things around cost of EDI, and it also right. clarifies that you're not going to get dinged for 20 years of past usage. Right. Um, so to hopefully clear the way for customers to step into what what's what's available. Um, so anyway, it looks like progress there. So that was kind of important and yeah. unus unusual for SAP uh, user groups to break that news. Um, I would have liked to see SAP mention that in their keynote, but at any rate. Right. Um, and and then I, I, I would be remiss without mentioning um, that uh, something Den Hallett, my colleague Diginomic, has been covering aggressively is the Elliott management piece of the story, which is that in addition to SAP's new profit guidance for its cloud and gross gross cloud margins, Elliott Management's taken a 1% stake right. in the company. They're considered an activist investor that's had its reputation for short-term pulls of returns on right. margin and capital and, share, and a focus on shareholder returns. Um, I think that makes me a bit nervous because I would like to see SAP have a lot of freedom to uh, to, to, to give breaks to customers right now in their transitions and not be so pressured right. by the markets, uh, then, then how it's very concerned about what this can mean for SAP based on past track records. And it's important to note that that's an ongoing story that didn't get a lot of attention this week. I did ask Bill McDermott about it in the press conference. Right. And, and he gave an elegant answer. He did. Um, and in a nutshell, he's saying that he thinks that SAP can essentially fund this stuff through their growth and that, and right. that they've made a ton of inno investments in innovation. Whether that right. plays out remains to be seen. There's a huge capital markets day in November coming up where they're going to be clarifying a lot of that stuff. Right. Usually I don't bring up finance stuff in a in a podcast that we do, um, but this stuff is is important in the backdrop. Right. I have found that not a whole lot of community members are too concerned about this yet, including customers. Yeah. Um, right. But it does tie in to concerns around the restructuring stuff because there's right. a lot of speculation that the two things have a relationship to each other. And, and so that's where community members are more interested is like what happened with that. Right. Um, and, and of course, if they feel like there is uh, an adverse force in the shareholder domain that's affecting what's happening in the community and for customers, then there's going to be a lot of concerns. So right. that's the story that's going to continue to unfold. Right, but um, I think it's still really early. Early days on that. Yeah, definitely. So, okay. So, all right, that's a good point for a short wrap, but then... Uh, what else sort of piqued your curiosity over the last couple of days? Anything? Uh, community. I mean, I think that'd be interesting to see what's happening in, in the community. I mean, just in terms of where they're trying to evolve it. I think that's an early important topic. Mm -hmm. um, and it looks like they're trying to sort of kickstart it again, which is really important. Um, it's going to be definitely going to be a challenge. Um, 
Yeah, I think they rolled out some new community leadership designations. Yes. Beyond the mentors, it's like. Yes. I don't remember the name of it, but. Yeah, that I mean, but just the fact that trying to rejuvenate the the community, which has sort of gone yeah. down in terms of its irrelevance over the last yes. five, ten, ten years. I think that's that's really important because I mean, I think it's how do you involve the developers um, in this sort of journey, and this is something that we've been discussing for years and years and years. But I think there's more in terms of how SAP is looking at sort of the uh, developer. If you could take a look at, for example, the um, GitHub site for SAP. Mm. Um, in the past, there were a few projects that were maybe two UI5 was maybe popular, but there wasn't anything beyond that. Now, it, the, the, the GitHub site is very active, and there are tons of projects. Right. Okay, so I mean, I think that they're, they're aware that they have to be more open as well. I mean, and it's funny, they've talked about this for, for years and years and years, but now you're really finding to see something. That and as yeah. well in terms of what they're doing with, like, the Cloud Foundry. Yeah. And it, look, I mean, I think this is a welcome period for SAP in the sense that they're no longer tr taking the stan annoying stance they did for so many years of, like, oh, you know, we'll build better proprietary cloud tools in Waldorf right. than you've ever seen in the wild. <laughs> and now they're much more, like, like, for example, their SAP Cloud Platform strategy has been completely reconfigured around right. use open source stuff wherever possible. Right. And we'll focus on business services and things that are really differentiated for our community, yeah. um, which is refreshing, but it points to the challenge around community now, right, which is that it's so hard. You can't build a website and say, hey, that's going to be our home base where everything goes yes. down. It doesn't work that way anymore. So how do you conceive of community when people are floating around all these different places? Yeah. I mean, because, know? I mean... There'll be one community for the people that are doing like cloud foundry work. There's right. another one for the individuals who are doing um, maybe machine learning. I think the question is, how do you bring these people back to the community site from SAP? I mean, I think that's, do you want to? Or do you sort of bring them into the other channels? I think that's going to be a real, a real challenge. Yeah. But I, I saw one in interesting thing talking about the, um, the, the cloud platform where they were showing, because I mean, they, they're focusing more and more in terms of the hyperscaler support in terms of the Cloud Foundry. And what's intriguing is that you really have two, two strategies. One is that I can have my code work on Cloud Foundry in these different instances, on these, in these different environments. But as well, each environment has its own specific flavor, has its own um, services, which are their strengths. And there was one um, slide that I saw that showed that if you going to GCP, then these are the services that you should try and use. So it means that they're they're being much more differentiating in terms of the strategy that customers should use when they're picking a hyperscaler, for example. So mm -hmm. they're, they're becoming much more aware that they don't provide everything. SAP can't provide everything. There's other partners, not only open source, but the hyperscaler partners as well that provide functionality that they can't and shouldn't do. Yeah. And I thought what, what what I thought sort of summed up the interesting challenge for SAP there is that that's the right approach for today's customer for sure. Um, but deriving revenue from that model yes. is tougher because yes. you don't own everything anymore, right? right. And uh, I thought it was really interesting because I talked with um, – ASUC's published some interesting stuff on transformation in S4 as well. And they're, they're, one of the big things from their data is customers – they haven't moved. A good chunk of them are looking for business case right. around it. Um, and ASA did a great job of surfacing uh, customers that I could talk with this week. And I talked with Ron Gilson, who's on the board, but he's also with Johnsonville. And they, they actually successfully completed an S4 migration over the course of nine months. And that was interesting because that's that they said it was pretty easy, but the catch there is that they avoided technical debt. They, right. they always stayed on top, so for them right. it was easy. But it was technical. It wasn't informed by a transformation plan of the kind that you okay. kind of hear on stage. And so I asked Ron, you know, so when when your business does undergo various transformations and, and new customer focus initiatives and things like that, like will you go with SAP? And and he said, well, we don't care. Like our business leaders don't yes. care. He said, you know, it, we care about outcomes, not who we're going to use for that. And, and I think that's just so interesting as far as he was like, it could be SAP, it could be IBM, it's whoever can yes. solve this particular problem for us. And so that's the interesting sort of era that SAP is moving into where it's going to find itself much more in, in, in competition. Yeah, I um, mean, 
I think that's the interesting point because we were talking to one customer, it was a, a bank in Australia who are using the APIs from SAP's um, cloud for, for banking product. But the API is only. The actual application is running, I think, on AWS. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and that's, and I was trying to talk to the person with Bank about why don't you put it on on um, the, the, the cloud platform. And she said, the architects look at the various options and they decided AWS. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a realization as well. Yeah. I mean, and one of the things that SVSOS remembers is that the, the distance services that you discuss, um, that's really the treasure chest. Yeah. That's sort of the IP that they should really surface and push out. Yeah. Um, and if there are services that provide value and that are unique, those are the ones that people are going to use. Yeah. Yeah. I had an uh, almost a polar opposite conversation with, with Bombardier, also uh, an ASUG member. They're going through a multi-year transformation plan um, that's basically everything. And but what I thought was so interesting about theirs is it really centered on culture. And, uh-huh. and when they had their initial meetings, they had already decided they were going to go with S4 for, for, to, to power all of this. But they didn't even show functionality at first. They, they, they brought in kind of, it was more of a whiteboard thing of what would be the best way to reimagine our business and all this stuff. And, uh-huh. and all the executives involved in that. And, and this is a multi-year scenario. Um, so at the end of our conversation, I asked him, like, I, th- I said, I said it was refreshing to hear how much every executive's on board with this, and you're, you're, you're all in the white, you know, in a whiteboard setting, and, and then you, and then you map it, make sure it fits S4. That's great, um, you're set. But it's going to be multi years. Like, how do you, how are you able to justify that? And he said, well, I left out that we do have to have the quick wins, and that was one of the big focuses they had to pull out of that. They couldn't just do that exercise and just. They had to find a bunch of stuff they could act on to justify the exercise, and I think that that's where I'm always kind of looking for is where are the quick wins in this um, because I think for a lot of customers running on older versions of SAP, it's kind of daunting. Like, it's right. not that the real-time enterprise doesn't make sense. It's just like, wow. Right. So, and, of course, Holger Mueller is all jazzed up because he feels like SAP's finally recognized that it's not all about a memory and that a lot of right. work, you know, the, the Hadoop, Hasa was mentioning Hadoop for the first time. Right, on stage. Uh, so, so Holger's all jazzed about that. So, Yeah, but I think it's it's interesting looking at sort of these business cases and then trying to figure out, can they be standardized? Are they customer specific? Um, mm. And I think that's always the, the difficulty is that when you're looking at these migrations and you want to put it out on scale, which SAP has to do, yeah. How do you do that? I think that's yeah. definitely be a challenge. Yeah. And some of the Qualtrics use cases, uh, Phil Wainwright wrote one for us this week on Diginomica. Really interesting, the BMW use case. Uh, and I enjoyed reading about the impact of Qualtrics. I think I think I really underestimated Qualtrics um, as, as in terms of the, it's more than just a survey company. Let's just put it that way. Like, right. Like, I think they're pretty sophisticated in a lot of ways that people Cynic, cynical views wouldn't understand, right. but um, but there's a whole lot of work to do there. Um, there's ten uh, CX integrations that are that are basically available now or in the next month. Um, I think actually most of them are now. Right. And then um, and then there's a success factors integration on the employee experience side coming in a month. Uh-huh, um, that would be interesting. So to so that could be super interesting. So a success connect in the fall should get right. a nice gut check on that. Uh, so those are really interesting things. When I was talking with DSAG, I would keep asking them about various things, and they kept bringing the whole thing back to integration. Right. And in- integration is their issue, and, yeah. mas- and master data. Yeah. And, and, and SAP's commitments around that, and that's what they're all harping about on, on the DSAG side. And every time I brought it around, they kept saying, well, yes, of course. If it's, if, and, and one thing they said is that forget about the X, we, c- we haven't integrated the O yet. Right. And, uh, and, and they want to see much more of a deeper commitment to integration. Um, and, and I think that is an interesting evolution um, that customers now expect where for a little while I think everyone was like, well, just open up the APIs and you right. know you can do what you need to do. And that, that's not going to fly, right? And so right. It's, it's much more complex. I mean, it's, it's much more of a challenge making sure that everything works and yeah. making sure that, I mean, if you have a SaaS application, that's good. But, I mean, you also have to realize that there are, it's it's the E2E process that has to be understood, and I yeah. think that's the, the that's the challenge because it's not just one application, not just three applications, could be four applications, 
Um, and as that complexity increases, the ability to have the integration work successfully gets mm. more complex. I mean, I'm always worried that as SAP starts pushing sort of this microservice-based architecture, how do you deal with the operational impact of that of that change. Yeah. And I think that's because I mean it's great to put a thing together, but what happens not on day one after they go live, but a week later when you have an issue? Right. How do you deal with that? Are partners ready to deal with that? You find out firsthand that microservices are not a cure I mean, all. Right. I mean th- yeah. they are definitely an architecture which is which is very useful, but the question is there's a lot of stuff that goes on with just doing the the development work. Yeah. And I think that's the thing which is really Really interesting to take a look at, and how SAP will support people in that area. Um, and yep. I've also seen, for example, some of the new work they're doing with Extension Framework, for example, which comes from the old Hybris team right. and other individuals from SAP as well. I think that's really interesting how they're supporting things such as serverless and things like that, and the ability to have these small chunks of uh, functionality which go, which respond to an event. I think that looks really good. Because it will provide people the ability to to make these changes in a fashion which might be um, less disruptive as something that might be in a monolithic application, for example. Yep. And one other thing I just wanted to mention along the lines of integration is that SAP doubled down on its success factors S4 HANA integration in general, uh-huh. which I think is an important hat tip to uh, Workday. Uh, which is going to the market right now with integrated financials and HR, right. um, and but also SAP realizes that's got to happen. Yes. And uh, on stage, it, it was uh, Christian Klein had talked about a unified data model. Uh, right, that's also and, critical. And he clarified off stage that that by the end of the year, it's not going to be everything on that. There's specific a couple of specific areas, including Success Factors S4 HANA Finance that are the focus for this year. Right. So that was a little bit misunderstood, and I'm going to add that to Dennis's post uh, about the right. Day 2 keynote. But but anyway, it's a commitment that's been made to that area, and that will be, I think, an important story to but watch. I mean, I mean, the master data is critical not only for the integration between um, S4 HANA and success factors, it's the heart of basically anything that, that they're going to do for the intelligent enterprise. And we, we talked about this last year as well, because, I mean, the thing which is always interesting is to try and figure out, okay, if you have a business partner or you have a user, then that has to be, the data has to be the same, basically. Otherwise, yep. you will have um, issues in terms of data quality, in terms of processes, might not be work as, as, it, as you expect. So that's something that they got to deal with um, ASAP, basically. Yep. And like I said, we looked at it last year, and they actually had a pretty good architecture. Why they didn't move forward on that, I'm not really sure. Yeah, and that was actually one big theme. It seemed like a few balls got dropped on important projects, which is inevitable. At least there's a perception whether right. that's always true with that restructuring. It's very hard. Maybe some right. of them are continuing under different auspices or different contact right people. But we've lost track of some projects that were kind of important. And yes. It, yeah, SAP is going to need to clarify that going forward. So. Right. All right. I mean, well, I think I mean, the last last year we had a lot more detail regarding the the intelligent enterprise, really what's under the covers. And this area was once just a, like a black box again. Yeah. Roadmaps, roadmaps, roadmaps. Definitely. Bring back the ugly PowerPoint slides. Yeah. All is forgiven. <laughs> All is forgiven. Let's see the slide decks. Yeah. Well, there's a lizard sticking out a tongue on us. John Appleby is looking for me, and you have to catch a plane, and yep. these weird, nasty bugs are flying all over the place. They're so called, I think, love bugs. Love bugs. I think that's our cue. Maybe Definitely. the lizard is going to eat the bugs. It would be nice, luck. but he would have yeah. uh, a lot of bugs to eat. Uh, anyhow, thanks for the annual okay. podcast. Always yeah, a pleasure. Great. Thanks, Dick. Thanks.